Could I finish that line? We've got a panel to get to. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> um, we're actually welcoming a couple of new speakers tonight. Um, so along with Jane and Iqbal, um, and of course James, I think you're a bit of that, yes. Um, we're actually adding um, Dr. Henry, right, to the spiel. Yes, of course, Dr. Henry Williams. I, I didn't actually check your surname before. Yeah. Did you want to add a quick word about uh, what you're into? He was just sharing it with me and I was like, yeah. Sure. Um, so I'm with the Center of Automation, Robotics and Engineering Science. Pretty sure I got that right. Um, we're Kiers with a robotics lab here at the University of Auckland. Um, our research group is involved in all things robotics and machine learning. So we're developing automated systems for um, harvesting kiwi fruit, apples, pruning vines, all the way through to healthcare systems and social um, sort of robotic systems, all the way through to robots that are trying to learn to sort of manipulate and control the environment through flailing around wildly for hours on end until they figure out how to actually do the task without us having to manually program the robots ourselves. I think my students run away, but one of my PhD students was here and he spends many hours coming up, waking up in the morning, getting to the lab and going, have you learned to do the task? And watching the robot sort of semi doing the task better and better every day. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Um, and we've got another uh, uh, avatar, or well, another person joining us for, uh, for tonight too. So let's welcome Masood. Wait a minute, what are you doing over there? Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. My name is Masood, and I serve as an AI avatar at Tech Talk. I am powered by ChatGPT and Movio. In the near future, I hope to contribute more to education and career development by providing personalized learning experiences, identifying knowledge gaps, and offering targeted resources. I am proud to share the stage with other amazing panelists and excited to be part of this conversation because technology is a critical component of our future education. I hope you enjoy the evening. <laughs> Welcome, Masood Avatar. <laughs> Um, ladies and gents, can you give us a round of applause for our, our awesome panel? There you go. This is happening. What did, uh, what did Iqbal say? The future's here. Right? It's just not evenly distributed, I would say. <laughs> um, okay, so the first question I've got for our panel is, um, well, it focuses on the importance of ethical use of technology and learners' privacy. Um, our first question is, we. Um, how do we ensure ethical use of technology in education and professional development while protecting learners' privacy and personal data? Do you want me to repeat that? Ethics. All about the ethics. So it's up on the screen there. Um, how do we ensure the ethical use of technology in education and professional development while protecting the learners' privacy and personal data? It's a very long question. I think it's a two-part question. But anyway, um, I guess for us, uh, with our ethics approval, and I used to be a, well, still kind of am, a um, uh, design researcher as well, there's always an element of just being really clear with what you're going to be doing at the end of the what um, data you're gathering, trying not to gather more data than you need and require that time, be really clear with what you use of that data and how that translates in a technological kind of environment as well. Um, obviously, in all academic settings, there's rigorous kind of ethics approval process, quite arduous, sometimes quite painful ethics approval process that you have to go through. Um, and I believe, strongly believe, that industries need to, I don't, I don't know, I don't, I'm not a big fan of over-regulating things, but having clear principles or guidelines that everyone, uh, I don't know if you can even adhere to them, but agree on somehow because um, things are changing quite rapidly and we need to definitely do something about this. Anyway, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, I'm happy to answer. To it. And, uh, this is a good question. Um, always there's a debate between um, privacy and security. We made it easy with, uh, with like our environment with Mercury. We have a different team of privacy. So whenever we have any solution, including this kind of, let's say, imagine we have learning team as well. Uh, we refer them um, to privacy team. And usually, again, we're always I'm saying we do not need to reinvent the wheel. We are following with NZ Privacy Act 2020. So there are like 
15 areas or criteria we have to follow. One of the areas is security, the rest not security. For example, if you want to get any kind of information, you have to have consent. If you want to use it for something else, you have to have consent and so on. I'm not talking about the privacy one, but usually for any solution, including the educa education one, uh, we do a privacy impact assessment. And without passing that part, we're not allowing any project to go live. That's why we just we try to be live. But um, my people ask, hey, uh, you talk about Privacy Act uh, 2020. How about GDPR, which is like a um, Euro European one, and also California Act as well. Uh, the good thing with New Zealand, always our, our act or our regulation always comes after, like, you know, after all. Yeah, that's why we were the last one. And I'm glad that this ends at Privacy Act almost aligned with a GDPR and California Act as well. So regardless of where you are, we try to be aligned with the privacy and um, yeah, consider privacy for our users, including the learners. Really quick story about that came out recently with DALI, which has been trained to do all the image generation. Um, researchers were able to recreate all the training data that the system was trained on within the network itself. So the network was been trained on all these images that have been scraped from online and have been taken from all over the place. They were able to recreate all those images from the neural network. Now, for image generation, that isn't too scary, but if that was trained on, say, healthcare data or personal private information, you might be able to recreate all that personal information from these networks that actually have this information encoded in them somehow. Mm. Now, whether that will translate to some of the other networks, they're not sure yet, but the fact that they can do it with images is problematic and has raised a few concerns. It's also how a few people, artists, found out that their work had actually been illegally taken and trained on the network in the first place. Mm. I wonder what um, Masood's digital avatar might have to say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cole Art. Such an important question. I acknowledge the informative answers from other panelists. The ethical use of technology in education and professional development is a critical issue that needs to be addressed. It's not just about the technical aspects of data collection and storage, but also about protecting learners' privacy and personal data. It's a multifaceted issue. That requires collaboration between stakeholders such as educators, institutions, governments, and technology providers. There are several key steps to ensuring the ethical use of technology in education and professional development. One, developing clear policies and guidelines. Two, implementing privacy by design. Three, consent and control. Four, limiting data collection and retention. Five, training educators and staff. Six, regular audits and assessments. Seven, collaboration among stakeholders. Eight, legal compliance. Nine, promoting transparency and openness. And finally, 10, fostering ethical innovation. By taking a comprehensive and proactive approach, we can ensure the ethical use of technology in education and professional development while protecting learners' privacy and personal data. <laughs> well, thank you, Masu. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Uh, I think we can probably tolerate one more question and then we'll open it to the floor. Mm. <clears throat> tolerate one more question. What do you mean? That's that? <laughs> All right. Uh, so, our second question for the panel tonight um, focuses on 21st century skills and an uncertain future. Um, our question for the, for the panel is, how can we design and implement technology-orientated learning environments that foster the development of problem-solving and critical thinking skills while also ensuring that learners are able to adapt to new challenges and uncertainties in their future careers? Wow, that's, there's a lot of parts to that. Who's first? Sorry. Um, it's, funny. First, right? <laughs> it's funny, I've actually been talking about this a lot with um, my colleague with one of the courses we're running because all of this AI stuff that we're teaching is developing, uh, developing so quickly that some of the stuff we would teach now is going to be out of date next year. So we have to update it regularly. So it's, I think the critical thinking is already in there. 
it's actually focusing more on the critical thinking skills and the ability to evaluate, well, is this doing what I think it's doing? Is it going to do what I want it to do? And how can I constrain it to the task I want more than here's how you use ChatGPT4 when we're going to have ChatGPT10 by two years. So focusing on teaching that specific tech is kind of a waste of time. In fact, I showed the class today how one of the algorithms that we've been using for the last 10 years used to take 50 lines of code. I can now just import it in two statements and run it. So teaching them how to implement it's a complete waste of time. It's really been able to critically evaluate, should I be using this algorithm for this task? Whatever that happens to be. And trying to teach that's quite tricky. Yeah, I completely agree. It's less about teaching, I guess, how to technically use the tool and more about critical thinking. And um, yeah, 21st century, I was thinking at Culloden, my little Kalat's kid and my little kid go to a school called um, Hobson Ball Point Primary School and it's all about child-led learning. It's all about the pedagogical style I feel is really innovative and it's all about focus on 21st century skills. So things like child-led, um, communication, creativity, um, I guess designing from a, a bit of a passion or a sense of purpose as well. And that's something that we also try and advocate with our, um, and encourage in our students, postgraduate students. So it's really, again, teaching context rather than content and really thinking about, okay, I think you had this wonderful quote around, um, it reminds me of a whakatoki, which is kamo kamuri. So when you're moving into the future, remember to look back as you move into the future as well. So trying to understand where you come from and where you design from and everyone has a positionality of how they they research, create, um, or do create things, do things. And every kind of, I heard this quote around, every research piece is also me search to a certain extent, something that you believe um, and feel passionately about. So I think that actually the, with the future of this rapidly um, changing times and technological changes, being deeply human is going to be incredibly important. Um, good question. Um, uh, not relevant to my current role, but um, just I'm talking about current and also I'm talking about the previous role as well. I have fortnightly meeting with our vendors, including Microsoft, AWS, and all big vendors. Mm -hmm. And always I'm asking them to talk about last 15 days, what kind of like new technologies and so on they have and how we can leverage in our environment. This is uh, with my team. I have someone just particularly um, responsible for that. So we get the latest update and we'll try to leverage, you know, that new features in our environment. Uh, but when you talk about my previous role, because I was working with four universities uh, from 2015, 2020, and I was developing uh, like courses and so on, it was my pain. How can I do? And I, I just, um, every semester I have to prepare everything from scratch because of the evolving, especially with my, my area. Um, I think, I think, um, Industry, especially, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the cyber and IT, mm -hmm. uh, is, is leading even the, the education sector. So what I did, I've tried when de developing any kind of courses to be aligned with the, the current industry. What industry is, 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 um, you know, looking for, especially I was, I was, uh, leading some part like industry connect, uh, with AUT. So I knew what exactly industry is looking for. I was leading a digital forensic lab working on blockchain and so on. That's why I've tried to update the, the courses, um, that I was, I was teaching. I wonder what Masuda has to say. <laughs> Thank you for raising this important question. As a panelist, I'd like to emphasize that designing technology-oriented learning environments that foster problem-solving and critical thinking skills while preparing learners for future challenges requires a multi-dimensional approach. In my view, to be successful, we need to consider the following key strategies. We need to engage students with learning materials, peer collaboration, and real-world applications through project-based learning, case studies, and simulations to promote problem-solving and critical thinking. We must provide students with diverse learning resources and equip them with the skills to use technology and digital tools effectively. We should foster a culture of continuous improvement and lifelong learning. 
Another important consideration is designing adaptable and flexible curricula that allow students to explore various topics, engage in interdisciplinary learning, and pursue their interests. We should also promote collaboration and teamwork. We have to apply personalized learning experiences. Moreover, as an educator, you need to connect learning experiences to real-world situations. And last but not the least, we need to establish a safe and inclusive environment where students feel comfortable asking questions, sharing their thoughts, and taking risks. By incorporating these strategies, we can effectively equip students with the essential skills they need and help them prepare for uncertainties and challenges in their future careers. Thank you, Masu. <laughs> um, I wonder if we could open it to the floor for any questions. Christian. <laughs> um, there was one statement that kind of blew my mind, which was uh, that they could recreate the data that it was trained on. Hmm. So my question then is, would a thing like ethical training ever be able to exist if that is the case? <laughs> Don't know, but similar to the making AI to determine if it was chat GPT or a human, there'll probably be techniques that try to encode it deeper so that you can't, but then it almost defeats the point of when the network could still then operate. It's a relatively new thing, it was in the last six months that the paper released, so there's still a lot of people going, oh crap, um, how wide is this a problem? At the moment, it's very specific to image data and the exact CNN networks and stuff, whether it would apply to other classification networks is still unknown. But it's one of those things where everyone's just like, oh, we never thought, like no one considered this until someone just tried it. And now everyone's going, oh no, what, what do we do? So who knows, wait and see. Yeah, that's literally what they did. And something with the weights and biases, it's, it's a pretty cool paper. And it's, everyone's just like, no one thought it would be possible. Or well, no one thought to think if it was possible, actually. Mm. So who knows? Great question, by the way. Anyone else want to add? What does Masood think about it? Aha, we've just detected the limits of our AI box. It's a pair of coordinates. Soon I'm going to have to be Quickly, under the table. Ask that to be. Cool, thank you for that, Christian. Yes, go ahead. Hey, um, what do your students think about AI? Do, do they feel that it is something that they might need to compete with in the future? Or do they feel that it is a tool for them? Like, sort of, I'm, I guess I'm asking about um, how optimistic are they feeling? And whether or not you agree with that. Hmm. Oh. I need to think it through a bit more. I know you might have been good for that. Yes, uh, our students vary from faculty to faculty. So I guess with the Mind Lab, uh, the, the the teachers, and generally, I would I would say that they they're still curious and um, on the fence around whether AI can support or help them um, in their in their teaching environments. Obviously, the students of the Tech Futures Lab. Are all over it. They're really excited about the potential of it. They're technology te technology optimists, um, and they think it's going to change the world, their world, and the world around them. So again, it really depends on who you're talking to. But it, yeah, with we've seen that there's some students that are a little bit more cautious um, and feel really threatened by it, and then obviously some that are really excited by it. So, um, but you teach a whole bunch of students that really yeah it's, that's right. it's difficult because what i teach is how to make these things so ai is not yet capable of replacing us i hope <laughs> but um a lot of them uh don't i'm surprised when i asked the class the other week whether they use chat gpt as part of their courses and i did have to assure them it wasn't because i was going to punish them for it um not a lot of them seem to be happy using it yet because you can ask it a bunch of questions but it doesn't always give you the right answer. It gives you just a matchy pattern of text that likely could be true, but the more niche the area that they're asking questions in, the less accurate it is, that they stop really using it. And then they don't really start thinking, oh, it'll replace me because it's not that useful for everything. 
So I don't think it's at a point yet. I know a few colleagues who just do a lot of coding stuff where you can just go, hey, create me an app that uses this new tool. And as long as it's an up-to-date thing, it gives you a pretty quick and easy app. They're a little worried, but also they're stoked because now it'll take them five minutes to a job that used to take three days. Mm. But I don't think it's at a point yet where it'll be mass replacing most engineers, but there are a lot of people who do a lot of report writing. You can give it, you can give it data in a spreadsheet and ask it to give you a summary of everything. But that's more just automating jobs where people already do that anyway. And there's a lot of tools that already do that anyway. So it would just help the process rather than replace people at this stage. But it is a massive improvement over five years from where it was. So I'm going to ask my students that tomorrow, though. <laughs> like, that's exactly what I'm going to ask them. Good question. Yeah. Good question. So as I'm a student, I'm, I'm happy to answer this question because um, we... Uh, are using this as a tool uh, for our current like work. So we don't AI, we cannot, uh, you know, um, to be honest, to handle all of the incidents that we have. And also we're competing with AI, AI as well. So to answer to your question, we are, you know, uh, competing and as well as we are using as well. So yeah, because hackers or other people also are, are using like AI and it's not just new, it's like for more than 15 years. Um, which is in market, you know, people are using AI. Um, I'd love to ask you, because you used to teach in high school as well, how do you think your students would have felt? Or what is that? I think it really depends on what spectrum um, of... Yeah, um, <laughs> I think it really depends on sort of what spectrum they are sort of performing at academically yeah. because not everyone is going to, you know, um, mm. build these AI machines. Mm. There's a huge group of people who are very happy doing very repetitive, um, so-called tedious jobs. Mm. So um, I would I would assume that those people, which would be quite a large number, would feel very threatened by it, mm. because not everyone is creative, not mm. everyone wants to be creative, not everyone wants to have those critical thinking skills or mm -hmm. you know do those things. So mm -hmm. I guess as a society, we need to think you know where is their place mm. in um, in our world. Mm. Yeah. Right. I think you should join the panel. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, one last piece of advice as we kind of leave, leave the, or close the panel out. Is there anything you'd like to leave our audience with? Can I ask a question? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's coming through to me, I'm an older person. And I've lived through IT for the last 30 years. Mm. And to me, with each thing that comes along, everybody is going to lose my job. Mm. And it yeah. keeps on happening. It's repetitive. It's obviously going to be happening faster with things like chat. Mm. Having used it in certain ways, just to test it, I guess, write a bit of code, do the snake. Yeah. Um, but for me, though, all I see, it's just another tool that enables me to do something which I couldn't do myself before. I tend to be a learner. I learn things on my own. I'm a YouTuber. Mm. I learn, I soak up the internet. I become experts in this wang of stuff which I never could have ever done before in my lifetime. Mm. And yet, it's just an art tool. And mm. to be scared right. of it, I don't think so. But with the question though of not everybody wants to be mm. critical thinkers and dreamers, they just want to do something that excites them be it just ride a bike, mm. or maybe just climb a mountain, or check on the stars. But some people, though, want to make things that are more powerful, more exciting, I guess, to other people or to them, that suddenly the wealth of knowledge is being consumed, shrinking mm. more so into a phone or some glasses. and. You're walking along and chat DP, um, I'm not too sure about this direction here, but what are your thoughts and what schools are available here that I can pitch to? Mm. You could ask that question five years ago, maybe, on Google Glass, but today you can on Amazon Glass. So, you know, it's, it's happening, but to understand that um, creative thinking, though, it's taken me almost a lifetime to fully understand it. Mm. Mm.
Mm. Not really. Echo, echo his advice. <laughs> um, but I guess I, the your final slide really resonated with me around to learn, unlearn, and relearn, and to always be curious, kind of lean into that curiosity, not necessarily be afraid of what might be coming, um, and always applying critical thinking skills as well. I think, um, yeah, because someone asked me, Iqbal, what do you mean uh, by relearn? Um, and I just gave, gave her one example. Um, I, I learned, for example, network security um, 10 years ago. And always I'm telling myself, we are in Web3 and I have to relearn network security from not scratch, but from in this concept. That's why I just mentioned re relearn means you know something, the basic one, but the concept, the area, everything like changed. Yeah, that's why I just talk about the, the relearn one. Mm -hmm. Any? Wrapping up, concluding thoughts. Yeah, let's just keep relearning, but YouTube has so many resources that can explain really deep, complicated concepts and ridiculously cool visualizations. One that I keep reporting to all my students who don't think they're good at math, three blue, one brown probably the best YouTube series at explaining math concepts ever. The visualizations on explaining really deep concepts is phenomenal. And there are hundreds of YouTube videos, really well edited, really well done, that explain these concepts in ways that you just makes you understand it. You're like, oh, there's a pretty picture. Oh, now I understand what that damn thing is. Instead of being this weird equation, there's a pretty picture. Now I understand it. I am very picture oriented. If you don't draw a picture, I won't understand you. It's just how I work. I am an engineer. But there are heaps of videos online that explain all these concepts that are completely free. Mm. And my YouTube, my lectures are covered with YouTube videos for students to explore because they explain it better than I do. But everyone can explore them completely for free. So there's no excuse not to be able to do it. You just have to give it a go and just slowly click a deep set of YouTube videos and waste many weeks watching them. Just a um, ladies and gentlemen, can we please give our speakers a warm, 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 warm.